one of the biggest things is um, Peter wrote this book um, <laughs> as a warning uh, to that tech companies and automakers are making big promises they can't keep. Um, and it's as a way to attract consumers and investors. And so, Peter, the question really is, why did you feel so compelled to, to share this warning with us all? Well, thank you, Danielle. Um, I, I want to begin first by thanking everybody who made this event possible. It's amazing. And also, I also want to work in a little correction. I'm not a thought leader. I'm a thought fault finder. And uh, I'm also a thought studier, so I try to revive thoughts that have been overlooked, maybe because they didn't have enough of a platform to get the attention they deserve, or maybe because they've been forgotten and left in the past but are worth revisiting. Um, I, I think of myself more as a critic of thought leaders than as a thought leader, but I know the, the, it was meant as a, as a kind compliment and I receive it in that spirit. I wanted to write this book. It, first of all, it was not a book I would ever have imagined writing. I'm a historian, I think about the past, but uh, when I came to audiences like this one and people would ask me about what the significance of that history is for our future, I thought I had to start to study this future and the people who are purporting to tell us what it will be, often telling us about the future as if it's already been chosen for us without anyone asking us. And then as I started to look into this future, it struck me as a retread of a future we've been sold four times, and all the previous three iterations all failed abysmally, and the fourth iteration is the same sales pitch as the first three. I, I, let me work in uh, the title. The title is Autonorama. I think a lot of you have figured out what this means. So this first iteration of a future of a city where you can drive anywhere at any time and park for free when you get there without delay was called Futurama. It was General Motors' term. They were combining the words future and diorama, make the future visible. That's circa 1940. 25 years later, uh, it was a total failure. You know, they devastated cities and you still couldn't drive even if that's the way you got around. So they had a retread. They called it Futurama II. Uh, that was a failure too. So there was a, a, a second retread, 1990s. They didn't call it Futurama 3, but it's, the, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, you've heard it probably as being called Smart Highways. Uh, total failure, cost billions of dollars, and we got uh, variable message signs out of it. And um, now I think we're on the fourth iteration. 25 years after Futurama 3, we have Futurama 4 or Autonorama. Notice that the interval in each case is 25 years. That's why a long answer to a short question. This is great. And, and maybe a question is, what happens when we let other folks set what our future is going to be and what our goals are, and most of all, define what our problem is? Well, they get rich, frankly. Uh, <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> yeah, they, when they convince us that what's good for their bottom line or for their investors uh, you know, is, is uh, good for us, then we become their pawns, their means to an end. Um, companies, uh, I, I don't want to paint too broad a brush because there's a lot of great companies out there, but essentially if it's a for-profit company, uh, that term has a clue in it about what the company is for. And this means that if they say that they're for mobility, or they're for streets for people, or they're for, uh, you name it, sustainable futures, we should be careful that that's really what they're for, since after all, they are also at least, uh, also, at least in additionally, they're for uh, profit. It could easily be uh, that they are for profit and the rest is just uh, a story. There's a, a proverb, probably you've all heard it, uh, fool me once, shame on you, right, for fooling me. Fool me twice, shame on me, uh, for being deceived again. And now if that pro proverb has validity, we have to have a memory. And I fear that we don't. We have a short memory. Uh, we don't tend to, we don't know firsthand what happened more than a generation ago usually. Um, and we need to recover that memory, and that's why I think history has something to offer. 
For sure, for sure. And so we had a nice discussion about how automakers are getting the problem wrong, right? And you had this like really great like cigarette analogy that I hope that you could share with everybody. Um, but I also want to talk about you know how might some of us multimodal evangelists also be getting the problem wrong? Such an important question. Um, so the, that uh, analogy that we we talked about before. Uh, goes like this. So, um, you know, it's, it's been clear that cigarettes caused cancer uh, decades before the Surgeon General's report of 1964. When that report was released, uh, we tend to remember that as, as a very constructive step forward for public health. What we tend to need to be reminded is that there was a delay, a delay of a couple of decades, a delay long enough to shorten the lives of both of my parents a delay long enough to shorten the lives by decades of millions of other people. And that delay was due largely to the tobacco company's very smart pivot, which is to say that you don't have to give up smoking. You can keep smoking just by our brand because it has this amazing filter with granulated carbon and a little plastic chamber with baffles and vents. And uh, it's just amazing. They had blueprints in the ads. Uh, or you get this low tar, low nicotine formulation. None of that had anything remotely close to the uh, protection that was necessary. But the ads were convincing, and we lost millions of people because of that. I think there's a very close analogy uh, with car dependency. Uh, the message we're getting now is that if you just get enough tech, car dependency will work. You get the LiDAR, you get the cameras, you get the radar, you get the 5G, you get whatever it is. Now car dependency will work. And my caution is that technology can be truly amazing, and at the same time, amazing technology does not make car dependency work. Thank you, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and so, Right, automakers have gotten the problem a little bit misconstrued for us, right? And so, do you feel that we could be doing more to move our multimodal future forward? Great question. So to start with the, that first point, right now, the way automakers and tech companies typically frame the problem, and, and, and this is what you deduce from their messages, they don't put it this way explicitly, but the problem from their point of view is, how do we make car dependency work? Which is the wrong problem, the same way as how do we make a, a tobacco cigarette that is safe? In both cases, there's a, a basic error in that we exclude other possibilities. The other possibilities can be better, in this case, are better. One is, it turns out being a non-smoker is pretty nice. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the second case, it turns out that car dependency is a practical necessity only in environments that have been massively re-engineered around the assumption that access equals access by car. And if you don't re-engineer the world around that assumption, then you have a great many choices. And if we've already re-engineered the world around that assumption, the fact that we did that proves that we can re-engineer it in reverse, which turns out, as hard as that is, to be much easier and much less expensive than re-engineering the environment around car dependency. Because, you know, setting aside specific environments, in principle, the least expensive, most affordable, easiest modes to accommodate, walking, cycling, transit, are also the most sustainable, inclusive, affordable, and healthful modes. Yeah, and I always like, I guess what I think is really interesting is like when we look at trips and we're like, what's the trade-off and what are people prioritizing? And so walking is great. I love to walk. We walked last night and it was really great. There was a question of whether we should take a car for our 15 minute walk. Um, and so I'm wondering what is causing people to make those types of decisions in terms of, right, we've seen so many different TNC reports that people are opting to take a car instead of walk or bike or take transit. And so I really what the question is, is like why we all know in this room why folks are deciding why, why those options are better in terms of, you know, for a multimodal future, 
but as you know, we think about our auntie or our kids or you know other folks that are within our social circle that are not you know die-hard transpos. Like, why are they not deciding to d make this shift with us? I think a, a, an essential way to s to start with that question is to explain the er erroneous way of, of explaining this, which is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. I, probably everyone in this room has encountered this multiple times where we hear about what either, it depends on, on who's framing it, sometimes framed as what people prefer, people prefer to drive. Very often it's framed as Americans prefer to drive as if Americans are like genetically different or something like that. Um, this, this is absolute nonsense, obvious nonsense, because of course if you build an environment where you have no good choices except driving, then the predictable thing happens and people drive. So we do not know what people prefer. Nevertheless, I see and probably you all see in top-notch engineering reports from state DOTs and so on, well, you know, it turns out that uh, everyone prefers to drive and that's why we have to, as a democratic body, we have to respond to the democratic majority. This is absolute nonsense. If we make environments where people have choices, I'm not even talking about restricting driving, if we have environments where people actually have good choices, all of a sudden we discover demands that are invisible right now. Like uh, there's an invisible demand right now where I'm from, Charlottesville, Virginia, for the L in Chicago. I took that in from O'Hare and it was, like I've, uh, it was like a dream come true. It was rush hour in the morning, morning rush hour. We're passing the Kennedy Expressway. There's late model BMWs and I'm like, turn looking back, waving goodbye at them as we soar past them in this circa 1980 shared rail car where I can read and, uh, well, of course, they're all on their phones too because the cars aren't going anywhere. But um, that, that to me, you know, I, I took the L in not because of, uh, I wanted to feel morally superior or because, uh, because I'm that uh, purely committed to sustainability and all that. It was the better way to come in. And when transit is the better choice, then the anti you referred to and the people we know, uh, once it's the better choice, they'll give that a second look. This is great. I, was, <laughs> I had a similar reflection well, yeah. during my ride yeah. into the, in, to the hotel today. Um, so I got in at 1 a.m. And so there was, uh, I decided to take a car, guys. I'm just going to be honest. Um, but <laughs> so I got to the, the, the pickup area, which was very hard to navigate. Signage is key. And um, there was about informally four lanes of, uh, to get to the pickup area. And it was great. It was like the cars were loading in every single lane. Um, people, there was no type of order, right? I love when passengers just like jump into the street and they think that they have this protective bubble. Um, this one gentleman dropped his water bottle and it slid under the car, so then he jumped, ran around to go pick it up into the lane of traffic. And the whole time I'm thinking about your book. And I'm like, I was like, what would autonomous vehicles do in this moment? Like, how would this be navigated, right? And so um, I thought it was really interesting during like all the simulations, like we saw the delivery simulation yesterday, and it's always interesting that there's not people in these simulations, right? Like, and so I, I just I guess I wonder like, where are the people supposed to go in our autonomous future, right? Like you think about, um, what is it, Minority Report, Cloud Atlas, like, you know, there's never anybody walking on the street. And, and so I guess I'm just wondering like, what do you think the automakers are really thinking when they're like pushing this image? Like, what, what, do, what is the actual ambition and what do you feel like is being lost for, for the consumer's perspective? Well, if you're in the auto business, you're scared because your model of guaranteed uh, business success year in and year out was car dependency and car dependency is not sustainable. That includes EVs, yes, we need to electrify no uh, battery electric cars with one or two people per vehicle is not sustainable either. Um, and you need to find a way that will make it persuasive to smart people 
in the general public that you can make car dependency work. And the, the, there's a thing that is a really powerful technique. So like there are techniques that uh, stage mu magicians use to you know, distract you with this so you don't look here and then you do this amazing magic trick. Well, there's something like that, that that has a proven track record in business for making things that can't work seem or, or seem credible. And that's just invoking the latest, most amazing technology. There's an amazing line from Arthur C. Clarke, the guy who came up with 2001 A Space Odyssey back in 1968. He wrote a, a letter to Science Magazine, same year, 68, and he wrote, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, which I think often the significance of that line gets missed. It doesn't just mean impressive. It means it also makes you feel like something you thought impossible is possible. And that is powerful because now you can say, oh, you know what? We can have no crashes at all because LIDAR, you know, because you know, of connected uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, because of 5G, whatever it is. This technology is amazing. Because it's amazing, our credibility drops. And because our credibility drops, that's right where they go in. You know, it's like opening the door to selling us this unsustainable future, a fourth generation now unsustainable future. And so I guess part of that is also the fact of, I think after TNC's autonomous vehicles quickly showed up on the streets and I think many governments started to think we're not going to let this happen again and we're going to you know, prepare for an autonomous future. And so I think I'm, I'm regularly disheartened to see like so many amazingly brilliant transportation planners and engineers spending their time trying to protect against something that's so far off. Um, I will definitely highlight a near and dear friend, Julia Friedlander, at SFMTA, former city attorney. And so, and she's just so impassioned by autonomous vehicles, and she's one of the most brilliant minds at the SFMTA. But I'm constantly like, I wish that Julia would work on transit, you know? I wish that she was going to work on, like, how do we, you know, something that we always worked on was like beyond roads. Right, and so beyond roads is the fact that we actually don't know much about our assets that are on the street today. We don't know how they're being used, what condition they're in, um, who's using them, and these insights would be super helpful right now, right? And so a big question that I have is like, where do you feel that us in this room should be focusing our attention, if not on autonomous vehicles? Wow. Uh... The, to me, the, the greatest threat of autonomous vehicles is not what happens when they come or will they come, but what they're doing to us right now in distracting us and diverting resources and attention, including the, the attention of your friend, uh, away from things that we have now that work. We know they work now. In, in the pursuit of things that don't work yet and may never work, except that they are working now in the sense of attracting a lot of funds, a lot of investments to the companies developing these things. So the companies developing them are making promises and they're attracting investment now on the basis of these promises while resources and attention are diverted away from the needs that we have as citizens who want to get around our streets affordably, safely, healthfully, inclusively. So that to me is the, is the big uh, threat of this promise of autonomous vehicles or this promise that high-tech driving solves all of the problems of driving, which it doesn't. Um, now, the tech can be incredibly helpful, but the word helpful is a really useful word because it tells us that it's about helping somebody. It's about helping people. Um, the way they use the term autonomous future, which is what the, the tech companies uh, use, that, that's presupposing that our future is a given and our job is to prepare for it. That the future is inevitable and therefore our job is not to choose from alternatives, but to get ready for the particular future that's being packaged and sold for us. And this is not new. 
In 1939, when you left the Futurama One exhibit, General Motors exhibit at the World's Fair of 1939, they gave you a lapel button. And the lapel button said, I have seen the future. That was a brilliant choice of words because it meant that General Motors picked the future for you and you have now had the privilege of seeing it. And what we have to do if we actually think we live in a country with something resembling a representative democracy, then we are the ones that choose the future and the tech companies then say, what, what can we help develop that will help you get to the future that you chose? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> There's like several things I want to touch on. I'm really trying to figure out which way to go. Um, I think one of, one of the things is like I like when I was reading and preparing for this was I feel like the distraction is the reason why I pivoted my career. So I used to work in San Francisco and primarily focused on working in the Bayview district and the, and the Fillmore district, which is primarily where the black folks in the city live. And so I did a lot of work with working directly with communities and really addressing their problems. And you know, you go to community meetings and you're asking, you know, what are, what are, what are your transportation problems? And they're like, we have homelessness, violence, we're looking for jobs, right? And I'm over here trying to be like, well, do you want a speed hump or a traffic circle? <laughs> you know, and so it's very frustrating, you know, and so I realized that there was a need to like translate, but also mostly a need to like break down the silos within government so that we could actually support the people and what they actually need. And so going to folks to ask them to define their problem. Um, it wasn't until um, Secretary Fox under the, uh, the Obama administration brought the, the USD Smart Cities Challenge um, right, that was an opportunity to get $40 million as a city, and so that's that instantly, right? Everybody dropped everything. And, and it was all for the vein of innovation and technology. And so I had been banging my head against the wall trying to figure out how to, you know, just get continental crosswalks for this neighborhood that clearly had the most traffic collisions and fatalities um, and trying to get a leading pedestrian interval put in. And so it's one of those things where I was like, I can either be mad about this or I can figure out how to make it work for the communities that need it most. And so this is why I decided to pivot to innovation was the fact that it felt like we were preparing for the Olympics. It felt like every single city department knew how to show up to a meeting, be actively engaged, and wanted to have their staff involved. And so that's why I decided to come over to innovation. And so it was really great to be able to meet with different companies and ask them what they're working on. Um, and I think many of you got to see Warren Logan and I's roadshow that we're 80% aligned when we talk to the, to the companies about you know, the, the problems that they want to solve, right? Congestion, um, the climate, um, making sure that people have access and things like that. I think the main thing is that we didn't agree on how to do that. That's that 20% differential there. And so I think one of the things that I see as the trade-off of this is where has equity gone in the conversation? And so if we were to pr pr push um, equity into the autonomous um, future that's being proposed, I think, Peter, you had a wonderful analogy about selling water that I would love for you to talk about. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Danielle, for that kind word. Um, I, I was just thinking of, of how we think of water supply as a public service, as a utility, uh, as a resource that is the right of every community. We can't even deliver on that uh, in the US by a long shot. But at least that principle is out there and basically understood. And that's because we don't think of water, uh, water supply for a residence, for example, um, as a opportunity for a market. We think of it as, as something that people need, right? Now, uh, we, th we have good examples of that in mobility and transport. For example, there was a principle applied in most uh, US cities 100 years ago where if you want to operate a electric street railway in the city, where as you know, almost every city had one, 
um, you have to agree to a lot of terms, and those terms are based on the principle that transport is a service like water supply. It's a resource. It's not a commodity. Yeah, we can to negotiate how you can turn it into a business opportunity so that you'll invest in the rails, but ultimately this is not uh, exclusively about making money. Well, when you have a water supply system that's privatized and commodified, what would happen is you take out all the, the sinks because you, know, you can't make that a going proposition. Instead, you sell everybody bottled water and all the wealthy people get bottled water and everyone else is going to have to scramble to find a way to get the water that they need. Well, that's exactly what's going on in transport right now and, it, and the so-called autonomous future would make it much worse. Namely, if you have the resources, you, you can buy yourself first-class mobility but if you're now living in this future and you don't have those resources, you're now marginalized. Uh, and that marginalization is not at all new. It's very familiar to anyone trying to live without a car anywhere, almost anywhere in America. Um, and trying to live with a car is an extremely um, large financial burden. Um, we need to recognize that basic transport is a resource. It's a public service like basic water supply, and no transport commodities, markets, uh, profit opportunities should be permitted that compromise that principle. They can be permitted if they don't, but there's some serious restrictions that have to, be, that have to kick in when they start affecting other people. We got a lot of work to do on that one. I, I love this analogy because I think about I think about all the different types of shared mobility, and I think, you know, they're all really great, don't get me wrong. I, I'm living a car-free life right now. My, someone stole my catalytic converter and I had to get rid of my car. So, um, it, was, it wasn't exactly by choice, but it's, it's, been, it's been almost a year, honestly, and it hasn't, it hasn't been terrible. Um, but I will say, like, as I use shared mobility as, as, a, as a dependent, um, you know, often I'm thinking like, man, who can afford this? Like the other day it cost me three fifty just to unlock the bike. And then, I, and then it was like, I only used the bike for nine minutes, right? And I almost paid $5. And I was just like, you know, I, 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 do, I do fine. But if, if I was somebody else, you know, that, that's a huge cost change, right? So it was either wait an hour for the bus or pay this five dollars to take a bike for nine minutes and so i think there's there's still like this this imbalance that's happening i won't even tell you how much my ride was to get from the airport to here at 1 a.m in the morning um but i will say it was a number of very nice meals um and so i'm just thinking about th this type of you know where is the equity within within mobility, right? I think, you know, there's been times where I've been walking on the street and people are like, gee, why are you walking, right? Or there's like a time where it's like, why are you on the bus? You know, and so I think there's this whole, there's a social dynamic that's happening as well, right? Like it's really nice to like, a car pulls up like, Yesterday, I was I was leaving. I was going to um, to Northwestern to go speak to the students at Kellogg, and it, the car pulled up, and it was really nice. The bellman like opened the the back door for me, and I jumped in, and I was like, oh my god, right? And so I think it's like one of those questions of like, how do we also address the the fantasy? You know, and so one of my favorite one of my favorite quotes is actually from Michelle Obama, and she says, "Government doesn't have a marketing budget, and actually, 10% of OEM's budgets go to marketing." And um, and so about for every single car purchase, roughly 7% of the cost of that car was initially um, a marketing investment. And so I think one of the big things that is always highlighted is our autonomous future has been very well marketed to us, right? And I think that's the other thing is like, I meet with a lot of different VC investors and they're like, well, tell me about this automation thing. Like, how far away is it? Like, you know, what is what is the CapEx on this? And things like that. And I think it's one of those questions and I, and I really like Rogelio was asked, like, when will autonomy actually happen? And honestly, who in this room can tell you, tell us when we'll get to level five? Does anyone want to, do we want to do guesses? Do we, no, no, okay. Six months. six months, right? Six months. 
So I, I think that's one of the things I always think about. But I will say, even though Elon is a very special character, um, I very much appreciate what he did in terms of electrification. Um, and I appreciate the fact that he made it sexy, honestly. Like, people in a Tesla, like you got that big ass screen in the middle of the car. Like, you instantly feel like you're in the future and you can see all the other cars around you, even in case your neck can't turn or something. Um, and so, it's one of those things where it's like, how might we sell a future that's different? And what is the future that you think we should be selling? That's an incredibly important question because it's going to take some marketing. It's going to take some public relations. It's going to take some attractive messaging, which uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about that from Andrew Baino at the last uh, plenary this evening because he, he's, a, uh, he's a master at that. Um, we have also to recognize that we got into car dependency because we were sold a very attractive future. That's what Autonorama is about. It's about the attractive futures that were not feasible, but were so attractive that we sort of were led along uh, of that path. And the, the answer to it, as I think you're correctly implying, is not just a so, sort of sober self-control that says, no, I will not be attracted by these attractive things. Rather, it's recognizing that we have, and when I say we, people interested in sustainable, inclusive, healthful, affordable mobility, we have extremely attractive futures to offer. Um, to, and w we can present those with the same uh, allure, right, of Futurama and of Autonorama. Um, and we have the advantage that these futures are actually feasible, right, which, you know, presumably ought to be an advantage. I, you know, passing cars on, on the Kennedy is a, was my recent experience of this actually feasible way to have relatively sustainable mobility actually also be attractive. And fortunately, there are a lot of people working on presenting futures of walking, cycling, transit, and other forms of sustainable, healthful, inclusive, affordable mobility uh, in ways that make, you know, will make people want it or help yeah. people see what it has to offer them. I totally agree, because I always think of like, I love to find out where the marathons are going to be and when they're going to be. I don't know if any of you guys take advantage of these road closures, but I'm always like, oh my God, it's so quiet here. It's so nice, it's so enjoyable, right? And so shout out to LA for Ciclovia. I always think that's a great opportunity. Sunday streets in San Francisco. I think many of us did some version of slow streets in their city. Um, and so I, I really am happy when there are citizens that are like, no, we want to keep our slow street, um, right? As we're reversing everything. And, and I think another thing is just like the parklets that have popped up since, since COVID. And so I think there's just been a huge opportunity to see um, the type of street design and ultimately environment that we could have. Um, but before we jump into questions, I wanted to pepper Peter with some really quick, um, quick response questions. So um, one is, what was your first car? A, first of all, I did have a first car. It was a, <laughs> it was a 1980 Datsun 310 that we called the wedding gift because we bought it for really cheap off a man who bought it for his daughter as a wedding gift. And she said, I can't drive manual. So he had to sell it fast. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Um, I am notorious for my road wage. It's a big reason I actually don't drive. And uh, so I wanted to know, what, was, what is your number one pet peeve in the transportation realm? Uh, my number one pet peeve in the transportation realm uh, I'm going to, I, I have a super long list, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, pick out, um, deal with it, Americans prefer to drive. We have to work around that fact because we're a free country, this is a democracy, and you egg-headed intellectuals have no business dictating to Americans how they choose to get around, even though in fact they have no choices. 
Got it. All right. Um, what is your most preferred mode today? I love a bike. As soon as I got to um, Chicago, I took the L down to Bronzeville. I got a Divi, and it. I don't know if it's okay to say this because I think Lyft is a sponsor, but I found it pricey. <laughs> but uh, I. Um, so you can cut that if you need to. Uh, and I, I rode it out to Englewood and back, which was a pure joy, just like those of us who were on the Equiticity Walk heard. People greet you when you're on a bike. They, don't, they just step out of your way if you're in a car, which is a joy. After working one more thing, to get from Bronzeville to Englewood, I had to go over the Dan Ryan Expressway. I've seen pictures. I had not seen it in reality. 14 lanes cutting right through the middle of South Side like a gigantic gash, moving people who don't even pay a toll for the privilege of using that road that is uh, ostensibly as a road connects people, but in this road divides communities. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate you highlighting that. I feel, I feel the same about 980 in Oakland. Um, oops, sorry, this rapid fire is getting far, more, far less rapid. Uh, <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> what is your most ideal form of transport when you go, become over 80? Bike. Okay, all right. I, I, feel, I hope that my hips are able to do that at over 80. Well, if I need it, there are now electric bikes, right? Hey. Um, what is your favorite transportation-related film or TV show? Okay, I, I have to say, I, I hope I get the title right. It's French. I'm a professor. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's called, it, and this is the English version of the t title, Cleo from 8 to 5. It's, if you, I, raise your hand if you saw Cleo from 8 to 5. Okay, <laughs> this, it's better to recommend something that everyone that hasn't already seen. Watch Cleo from 8 to 5. It's the story of one woman in Paris. It was made about 1960. And the whole story revolves around her need to get from different places. She uses every mode. And it's a, a joy to watch if you watch that kind of film. I love that. I love that. I'm always tweeting when I have a multimodal day. And so I, I love that. Um, all right, so in your book, you talk about getting, if you had 10% of um, the OEM annual budget and putting it towards a multimodal future. Um, and so I wanted to ask you instead, if you had 10% of the USDOT's budget, which is about uh, $14 billion, um, where would you invest? And you can only choose one thing to invest in. Only one thing. That's difficult because actually I see the real mobility future as being a diversified future instead of this monomodal future. And so uh, if it's only going to be one thing, then I'm going to say open up an office of mobility diversification. Love it. Love it. Um, all right, and then our, my very last question is, although Elon is a very special individual, he has made quite a significant change, and so who do you feel like today is the Elon Musk of a multimodal future? I'm a historian, and so I find that question a little difficult to answer and also a little sensitive because that would mean picking somebody out from a, a crowd of people, uh, a crowd of heroes, frankly, and I don't want to send the wrong message about excluding one of my heroes in favor of another. As a historian, I'm inspired most by people who strove in the past to restore sanity against the forces of, of, of insanity, frankly. Um, uh, and the, the one I would have to pick is Rachel Carson, who in Silent Spring wrote, uh, historians will look back and wonder at our distorted sense of proportion. Now, she wrote that in 1962 about insecticides, which she called biocides. You know, vocabulary in transport is always loaded. Same thing with, with her case. And what she meant, what she was saying there resonates with me as a historian, because I think historians in the future 
if we can have a future of, that includes historians who have that luxury, they're going to say we had a profoundly distorted sense of proportion today. Love it, love it. All right, um, and with that, we're gonna go to Q&A, folks. Questions? question about that. Uh, it can and it, uh, it has niche applications of all kinds. I think there's a reason why we, when we see it presented to us, it's typically presented as a sort of passenger car automation future because that's where the money is. Um, now when I say that that distracts us from other things, one of the things it distracts us from are the possibilities for automation that may be useful in um, uh, in public transport, in larger shared vehicles, uh, automation in tolling. Uh, I'm, there's a, a big trend in the tolling industry called road, road user charging, which is taking the tolling idea and sort of applying it to all vehicles, on, all motor vehicles on the roads all the time. And I think that could be transformative because if people actually paid for the cost of supplying this road capacity to a driver, uh, and the driver is willing to pay that cost, those funds could go into transit, those funds could go into community repair, like so the Dan Ryan d divided south side. What if the revenues from road user charging on the Dan Ryan went to Englewood, went to Bronzeville, to the communities in them, to, the, to Equiticity, to the people that are repairing the damage that those roads caused, not as some kind of donation, but as a payment, um, for you know the the uh, cost to those communities that was imposed upon them against their will. Uh, to return to your question, though, yes, there can be certainly applications of a, of automation in trucking and transit. I'm not the technical expert to sort of pick which ones look most promising, but I don't mean my caution against autonorama to distract us from the fact that automation can be extremely useful. an interesting question because it turns out that for all of human history all over the globe until uh, beginning in the US in the 1920s approximately, uh, typically later elsewhere where the car proliferated elsewhere in the world, those problems were all manageable. Uh, they were, ma and it's not to say they were always easy, no, they were always hard, but uh, they were much more manageable when you didn't have one or two people in a vehicle that was supposed to go 50 miles an hour and therefore needed a lot of space in front of it, a lot of space behind it, and occupied alone 100 square feet and had to be stored. It's amazing the opportunities that open up when you free yourself of that burden. I can imagine, to take your question a different way, what if there were a future world where somebody introduced an apartment house where they decided there had to be like a, uh, a separation of functions, so they zone the apartment houses, and everybody's kitchen has to be on the second floor, everybody's bathroom has to be on the third floor, everybody's bedroom has to be on the fourth floor, and so on, and they decide that because you're going to have to go faster now to get all that distance, everyone's going to have their own Segway, and now every Segway's got to have a path it can use. Um, you would have a design disaster in this apartment building. It would have to be maybe 20 times bigger. Well, if you free yourself of those things, and your silverware drawer is next to your sink instead of like on a different floor, now you don't need the uh, rapid elevator to get you, get you the spoon you needed back down to the kitchen. It's just like, I mean, the, the short answer is 
those cities you referred to did not have uh, zoning that pre prevented mixed use. Mixed use is a wonderful synonym for efficiency. Mixed use happens because mixing uses is convenient. Everybody in this room probably has a mixed use kitchen where you know the silverware and the water supply are next to each other. The cutting boards are in the same room. This is how ancient Rome worked. It's how those other ancient large cities worked as well. Yes, they had traffic jams. Um, it's amazing how often people seem to tell me that, oh, well, horses were a problem. Yeah, but you know what? You didn't ride a horse around town. People were not like, get, I live in Chicago in 1890, time to get on my horse. No, you just, you could take a streetcar, you could walk. So there's just so many more things you can do once you don't feel like you have to make the car work. Okay, so part one, a vocabulary is everything. I think everybody in this audience knows that from professional and probably personal experience. Vocabulary is absolutely everything. And vocabulary, you know, delegitimizes legitimate things and legitimizes crazy things all the time. That's what Rachel, why Rachel Carson said, for example, it's not a pesticide. It doesn't selectively, oh, that's a pest, kill it. Oh, that's a cute, that's a ladybug, don't kill it. No, it's, it's, they're biocides, that was her corrective. Now, um, in uh, th taking that to uh, the autonom so-called autonomous future we're being sold, let me work in parenthetically that even by engineering's own definition of the word autonomous, the vehicles that, we're being, that are being promoted are not autonomous. Quick true story, the word autonomous, I mean, everyone I think knows what autonomy is. Personally, it means that you make your own choices, you have discretion, you have judgment, you select from alternatives. That's human autonomy. Machine autonomy was introduced in the 1960s in the space race, as they said uh, at NASA, like we need a spacecraft where once it's out in space, it doesn't need signals from Earth to navigate. That means we are gonna have to put a window in it so that the crew of the spacecraft can navigate with a sextant via celestial navigation, and that will make that vehicle autonomous, They're, they are, i.e. not dependent on signals from Earth. So by that standard, a 1992 Ford Taurus is an autonomous vehicle, because you're driving there on that thing without GPS, and you're good, right? Um, and that a vehicle that requires high-definition maps, it's uploading all the time, GPS, uh, oversight from a, a central control in Tempe or whatever, that's the opposite of autonomous. By engineering's definition of the words, the only people responsible for flipping that around weren't so much engineers as the U.S. Defense Department. The Pentagon was the one who flipped those terms around, and a lot of tech companies were happy to go along with that maneuver. Uh, they made the excuse that AI makes art artificial autonomy real. It doesn't. Sorry for that long digression. Uh, m my button word is data don't drive. Okay, I am so, I, I'm, if you use the term data-driven yourself because it's good for you professionally, go right ahead, that's fine. <laughs> but the, it's a simple matter of fact that data don't drive, and here's the problem with it. When a company says, we have data-driven solutions, if I don't like them, I can't object anymore. I'm like, damn, I hate this thing, but they say it's data-driven and I don't have any data. So I'm doomed and I have to go along with you. It's just a way of pushing an agenda. When honest people say that their solutions are data driven and you ask them, well, what do you mean? It turns out they always mean data guided. You know, in other words, they, they, know, they have an idea about what's a good future and they need data to know how to get there. Data are like a compass reading. They don't tell you what port of call to take your ship to and they don't drive the ship. The sails, the wind drives the ship. Uh, and, uh, but somebody has to choose the port of call. You need data get to get to it. So my button is data don't drive.
to offer advice to a for-profit company about how to get it right because if it's a publicly owned company, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to earn a profit. This means that if they introduce other priorities, they may not, not only be working against their own bottom line, they may even be uh, vulnerable to uh, you know, a shareholder complaint that they're failing in their uh, fiduciary responsibility. Privately held company conceivably could be more independent of that. There's a movement, uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, of companies that are uh, held by people without being publicly invested in. They're held by a consortium of people who agree that this company will be committed to a certain purpose and they kind of insulate it from that pressure as a result. Um, but I think what, we, what will really help though is pressure lots and lots and lots of pressure. Uh, that's how, for example, DDT got banned. It wasn't because the companies decided, well, we should stop making it. Um, there are ways, though, to present this in such a way that it can actually be consistent with, you know, capitalism, provided capitalism isn't uh, reduced to the essential guiding force. Uh, quick example, U.S. forests were being, I mean, America was being deforested the word unsustainable totally would apply to this. I'm talking about circa 1900. Just clear cut, uh, erosion, uh, things couldn't grow back, forests were disappearing at an amazing rate. The situation today isn't great, but it's a lot better. It's a lot more sustainable because of the fact that timber was redefined from a commodity that you mine like we still mine ores into a resource that we manage. And there was a way of presenting that to the companies where they could see their own long-term interests. So the, if the company's horizon is long enough into the future, it sees it doesn't even serve its own interests to exploit it too rapidly. Unfortunately, right now, our company's time horizons tend to be extremely short because they're starting up, trying to attract maximum investment in the short term. That's why I think they're dangerous, and that's why I think we need a very strong public sector to manage this because uh, uh, a shrewd investment is no substitute for sound public policy. All right, and that's it, everyone. Thank you so much.